At Granger, we're for the ones who specialize in saving the day and for the ones who've mastered the art of keeping business moving. We offer industrial grade supplies for every industry with same day pickup and next day delivery on most orders, all backed by real people ready to help. So you can get the right answers and products right when you need them. Call, clickgranger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Lucky Land Casino, asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hey, all. Welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. As so always, go check out reallifepharmacology.com uh, when you subscribe there via email. We'll shoot you out a uh, top 200 study guides, 31-page PDF, lots of info there. Uh, I've pulled in lots of clinical practice pearls as well as things that uh, often show up on board exams or pharmacology exams throughout your career. So uh, a lot of good uh, experience, valuable information within that document. So um, go snag that for free at reallifepharmacology.com. All right, the drug of the day today is glimepiride. Brand name of this medication is Amaryl. And this drug is a sulfonylurea. So if you don't remember, we have covered, I believe, two sulfonylureas already, maybe. Um, glipizide probably being the most prominent one that I've seen used in practice. Uh, but I definitely come across uh, glimepiride a fair amount as well and just did the other day. Uh, mechanistically, a sulfonylurea stimulates the release of insulin from beta cells. And those beta cells, again, are in the, the pancreas. So that's important to remember from an adverse effect standpoint. So if you think about that, we're stimulating the release of insulin. So essentially, it's like we're giving extra insulin. So you could anticipate that the adverse effect profile is basically going to uh, mimic or be similar in many ways uh, to uh, giving insulin. So thinking about that, um, adverse drug reactions, low blood sugars, weight gain, those are going to be the most prominent uh, adverse effects there. And I'll get into those a, a little bit more. Uh, use is obviously diabetes. Uh, it is only indicated for uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, oral dosing. Um, so some, some of the newer agents, specifically I'm thinking of like the GLP-1s, those are injectable. So urea's are oral, which is, is nice, of course. Uh, most patients would prefer oral to injectable. Um, however, uh, you know, some of the adverse effects uh, maybe trump uh, some of the uh, benefits or the ease of, of doing oral administration. Uh, dosing for glimepirides, one to two milligrams uh, once daily is going to be your typical starting dose. Geriatric patients, if we have to use a sulfonylurea, again, they've definitely fallen out of favor uh, due to those adverse effects and the risk of hypoglycemia. Uh, but with that, um, usually we're going to start at the lower dose, so one milligram, uh, maybe even a half a milligram in some situations. Uh, just to um, try to pay attention to that risk for uh, low blood sugars in our geriatric patients or those that may be a little bit more uh, sensitive to, to medication. So one to two milligrams is usual starting dose, uh, max up to eight milligrams per day. Uh, diving into those adverse drug reactions a little bit further here, low blood sugar. So classically, that's defined as a blood sugar less than uh, 70 milligrams per deciliter. Okay. And as a reminder, I just wanted to go through some of those symptoms of hypoglycemia because I know in my geriatric patients, um, the symptoms of hypoglycemia can blend and blur with other conditions or other disease states or possibly infections. 
uh, and those type of things that that can go on. So um, obviously, if the patient reports uh, that they're hungry or very hungry, that might be (laughs) a good uh, way of initially recognizing that. Uh, Dizziness, shakiness, um, sweating, weakness, uh, tachycardia. And then obviously, as patients get lower and lower and lower, we get into things like confusion or falls or, you know, extreme uh, weakness. Uh, but again, these these symptoms are a gradual onset. I mean, it's typically not, you know, snap your fingers and, and now they're feeling it. It's, it's a slow, gradual onset, um, you know, over you know, minutes to, you know, maybe up to a half hour or so. So um, as that, that blood sugar slowly, uh, slowly dips there. And in elderly patients particularly, maybe even patients uh, who have issues uh, with cognition, um, it may not be recognized very well. So that's definitely um, in the long-term care consulting space when I've done that. And as I do that, um if I have a patient who's a frequent faller or they're, you know, reporting symptoms of dizziness, that type of thing, and I see they're on a drug like glimepiride, um, I'm definitely telling uh, nursing staff and caregivers uh, to pay attention to that and to pay attention to uh, blood sugar. Uh, because again, those symptoms may be a little bit more subtle uh, and you may not see all of them associated um, and it may be different from, from patient to patient. So again, uh, pay attention, you know, think clinically about our patients and if we're having, um, recurrent issues. And obviously we got to make sure those blood sugars aren't causing some of those symptoms. So low blood sugar, uh, top adverse effect. It's why the primary, one of the primary reasons why we don't use sulfonylureas as much anymore, because some of the other agents, SGLT2s, GLP1s, uh, we don't run into this uh, adverse effect uh, to the severe extent that sulfonylureas typically do. Uh, Weight gain is the other major issue. We've got other agents that generally cause weight loss. In our type 2 patients, um, they are typically overweight, not always, but typically uh, overweight, so we really don't want to add any more weight gain. Uh, And then lastly, with the adverse effect profile, I did want to mention there is a sulfa component with glimepiride. So if you see, uh, you know, rash, that type of reaction, allergic reaction, um, pay attention to those patients who have had maybe a sulfa uh, allergy in the past. Not to say that it's totally contraindicated. Um, In that situation, if somebody wanted to use glimepiride, Um, I would want to dig into that allergy history and say, okay, hey, what happened? Did you have, you know, Steven Johnson syndrome and it was a life-threatening allergic reaction likely to a sulfa drug or drug containing a sulfa component? That's a situation where it's like, okay, hey, let's look at other options and and what we can do here versus, you know, a very, very mild reaction, that type of thing. And, and again, cross-reactivity is pretty low generally, and there may be even some evidence to say that it's, you know, almost close to, to not existent between uh, various drugs. But uh, again, the evidence is a little bit blurry there, and when the evidence is a little bit blurry, in my opinion, you got to lean more on the uh, conservative side of, you know, paying attention, inquiring about what the reaction was about, and, you know, worst case scenario, hopefully um, we can identify an alternative agent that maybe doesn't have uh, that sulfa group if we are concerned about that. Kinetics. I definitely wanted to talk about this. So glimepiride does show up on the uh, beers list, which again, a good list of medications of potentially inappropriate uh, medications in our elderly patients. And it shows up on there because glimepiride does have a longer duration of action, which the advantage to that is we only have to dose it typically once a day. Um, But the disadvantage of that and what the Beers criteria points out is that uh, there's a significant risk for prolonged hypoglycemia. Again, that drug's going to hang around for a longer time and it's going to um, cause that prolonged 
hypoglycemia risk. So that is the downside of that longer duration of action. Duration of action, I think I mentioned, was about 24 hours. Pay attention to renal function. So some of the uh, metabolites do have some action. The parent drug does have action, but the um, metabolites, as the, the drug is broken down in the body, do have some um, physiological action, like sulfonylureas do. And um, the metabolites specifically uh, can significantly accumulate as renal function declines. So pay attention to that over time. You know, maybe a a 40-year-old patient was put on this medication 20 years ago and now they're 60 or, you know, maybe a 50-year-old is now 70 um, and maybe that drug's accumulating a little bit more and increasing that risk for uh, hypoglycemia. So definitely pay attention to that. There is also um, some important things to think about with CYP2C9. So CYP2C9 breaks down the parent drug into some of these uh, metabolites that do uh, remain partially active. Okay, And again, those metabolites may hang around longer uh, in patients with poor renal function. But if we also have drugs that impact CYP2C9, which I'll talk about in the drug interactions, that could potentially alter the action, alter the length of action or the significance of action, uh, depending upon what we're doing to that CYP2C9. And again, pharmacogenomics can play a role there too. If you've got a patient that has uh, a basically an inactive CYP2C9 or a very slow metabolizer there, we might get more of the parent drug hanging around and causing more of its effects, which again would be lower blood sugar, but potentially too much uh, hypoglycemia. So basically, if a patient is a poor metabolizer at CYP2C9, they may be more susceptible um, to hypoglycemia. That drug may have more action in that type of patient versus a patient that's maybe a rapid metabolizer there uh, at CYP2C9 they may have um, less activity and may need a higher dose, for example. All right, let's take a quick break from our sponsor and we'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material like BCPS, ambulatory care, geriatrics, psychiatric exam, NAPLEX, BCMTMS, definitely go check out meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. We've got a growing list of content, plenty of referrals from other candidates who've used our content and certainly passed the exam. So again, go support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. In addition, if you're a nurse, med student, PA student, uh, practicing or getting ready to practice out in the uh, real world, we've got great books on case studies, clinical pearls, Uh, drug interactions, drug-food interactions, a whole list of resources there. And my new book, MedEd 101 Guide uh, to Nursing Pharmacology, is specific for our nursing folks. So again, all those links you can find, meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. All right, wrapping up with drug interactions. So let's start where I left off, talking about CYP2C9. So CYP2C9 inducers will be more likely to reduce the action of glimepiride or lower concentrations. So classic example here is rifampin. Uh, It induces CYP2C9, which is going to lower the action or lower the activity, lower concentrations of glimepiride, the parent compound. CYP2C9 inhibitors can raise concentrations. And I've got two classic examples of drugs that I do see used out in practice quite a bit. So fluconazole has some CYP2C9 inhibitory activity uh, in Bactrim. So this is sulfamethoxazole. Trimethoprim uh, has activity as well. Again, two commonly used agents that uh, can inhibit CYP2C9 and could increase 
concentrations of glomeparide and ultimately lead to more effects, maybe more risk of uh, lower blood sugar, hypoglycemia, weight gain, things like that. Uh, other adverse effects I wanted to, or excuse me, other drug interactions I wanted to mention um, are basically opposing f- effects or masking potential side effects. So uh, let's start with opposing effects. So you've got to think about corticosteroids. So a drug like prednisone can raise blood sugars and potentially increase the need for uh, increasing the dose of glomeparide. Okay, those blood sugars will spike when you give corticosteroids. Very, very important to remember that. And also assess, you know, how long are they going to be on that corticosteroid? Do I need to adjust the diabetes regimen? So you've got to think about that clinically, what you're going to do and, and how you're going to handle that situation when we need, let's say, a prednisone burst, for example. And then one last one I wanted to mention was beta blockers. Uh, beta blockers can potentially mask some of the symptoms of hypoglycemia. Uh, there are a lot of uh, geriatric patients with a lot of cardiovascular issues who are on beta blockers. And there is that potential that some of the signs and symptoms um, may be blunted. So the classic sign or symptom that may be blunted is tachycardia. Beta blockers work to lower that heart rate. And obviously, um, we could blunt that effect and patients might not uh, recognize that hypoglycemia as much. All right. Well, I think that's going to wrap up the podcast for today. Hope you hope you picked up some clinical practice pearls. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, share us, uh, emails, social media. Also, leave us rating review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. That's greatly appreciated. Obviously, go subscribe at reallifepharmacology.com. Get your free top 200 study guide. That's a no-brainer. Uh, support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. I've got a ton of books there, ton of resources, uh, no matter what uh, slice of the pie uh, you work in as far as healthcare goes. With that said, you can reach out to me, Eric Christensen, PharmD, BCPS, BCGP. Uh, LinkedIn is a good way to track me down. I'm fairly active there. Uh, other place to track me down is probably my email, mededucation101 at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. At Granger, we're for the ones who specialize in saving the day and for the ones who've mastered the art of keeping business moving. We offer industrial-grade supplies for every industry with same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders, all backed by real people ready to help. So you can get the right answers and products right when you need them. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on ChumbaCasino.com. I looked over at the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's ChumbaCasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.